everyone. Welcome to Mental Net TV. My name is Sarah, and today I am honored to have Leather Leone with me. But before we start, remember to subscribe to Mental Net TV and make sure that you leave a really nice comment for me and Leather before you leave. Here we go. Hey, Leather, how are you? Hey, Sarah. Good to meet you, my friend. Good to meet you. Too. I'm so, so excited to have you on. And you know, I'm going to ask you all kinds of questions about yourself and your career. Um, so I hope you're ready for that. And I just want to start with, um, are you an East Coast girl? Because you feel like an East Coast girl to me. I am an East Coast girl, but unfortunately, not really the city. I grew up outside of Rochester, New York, a small mm -hmm. town. It's a dairy town still, more cows than people. But I went to school outside of New York City, so absolutely an East Coast girl. Yeah. Nice. I, of course, you can us East Coasters know. Yeah. We just know. We can just feel it yeah. from each other. Yeah. Yeah. So when you when you were growing up, um, what was the scene like, like musically? And I'm talking even when you were really little. Like, what kind of music were you listening to when you were young? My parents. Um, I'm Italian. Uh, Tony Martin. Uh, I mean, Dean Martin. Um, Tony Bennett. Uh, my mother obviously had Elvis Presley and. Um, Humperdinck playing. Yes. Um, and then my brother, who's a couple years older, obviously had the Beatles and like he was into Motown, the spinners. And my mother, oh God, my mother was always singing to me. So it was, I was always full of music. And then when I went to my Catholic school, I was always a young girl that had the balls to sing, like the Star Spangled Banner or some hymn. I was just a shop that would do it. So I think it was instilled very young in me and it was natural for me to do it. Either I, I couldn't do it well, but it was natural for me to go, hey, look at me, look at me. <laughs> you know, like I still am. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So singing was, it's because one of my questions was going to be why voice, but it sounds like it was just this intuitive thing that you just did. Interesting question, Sarah. I tried to play the drums. I tried to play the piano. I think it must be a certain side of your brain. I don't have that type of discipline or coordination. It was always really frustrating for me. I think, yeah, I was always here. Mm. It was always speech. And, and when I started to sing in church, I remember, and again, I didn't do it well, but I remember the effect I saw it have on people. I was like, wow. It just blew me away. So yeah, it was, it was always from here. That's amazing. So uh, you were listening to all this different music um, in your house. So it sounds like you had a very musical house and people who appreciated it. When you started buying your own albums and that, what, what were you gravitating to early on? Early on, I remember my mom letting me buy the Rolling Stones record with the zipper. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know what that one was, but I was totally into Donny Osmond, the okay. Osmond brothers, um, like any young girl, the Jackson Five, the Osmond brothers. But as I got into high school, I got into the arena rocks, being from upstate New York. It was a great tour circuit. I got into Fleetwood Mac and Boston, Ambrosia, Ario Speedwagon, it, Fog Hat. And my dad, it was so funny, I opened for Alice Cooper. My father would ne never let me go see him, but I started going to these shows. So it was at Arena Rock. And I would get backstage somehow as a young person and just go, fuck. I remember Blue Oyster Cult show. I was there for the sound check and the sound of that bass drum, this young person just, I mean, it made me cry. I was like, I have to be part of this. And I would be backstage with all the side hat wives going, oh my God, I have to do this. And I would go, no. No, you don't want to do this. Yeah. So the arena rock blew my, the power of that blew my mind. And does that make you like want to be a fan of it and be a part of the culture? Or did that make you want to play? No, I wanted you ready to, to do, do it, it for me. real. Yeah, so what I was wanted your, to be them. Yeah. What was your next step? What was your next step? I went to college loosely outside of New York City. And I started singing in cover bands. Again, we're talking about the early 80s. Um, so I was singing Pat Benatar. Oh, and excuse me, somebody turned me on to heart when I was in eighth grade and I heard Annie and I was like, mother of God. Um, so I started singing heart and Benatar and it was cool because I was the only woman in town that could hit the Pat Benatar notes. It was so cool. Um, and then Robbie, my guitar player, said to me one day, let's try to sing um, ACDC, Janis Joplin. I could not do it. But again, I remember going wow it, it was just this opening again I couldn't do it but I can remember being really affected by it that was the next step I was singing rock and roll in upstate in outside of New York City I met a gentleman who had a band called Test Two Babies <laughs> knew nothing knew nothing about vocals he hired me to sing backgrounds okay we opened up for Joan Jett and oh, I can wow. just remember. and of course we all had the Joan Jett haircut the place is still there it was at the chance in Poughkeepsie 
anyway, so then I got into my first recording studio and, and I just loved it, but I didn't know anything. I just got thrown into that. And I'm sure my harmonies were wrong, but they were like, yeah. <laughs> and I would be on stage and I got all this attention from, yeah. So my, yeah, that was the next step. That's amazing. But very poppy. It was poppy music though. Okay. So it sounds like, it sounds like you are, this is my takeaway. Let me know if I'm wrong. Like you, it sounds like you were self-reflective enough to know that like I could be doing more and I could get even better and better and better, but clearly people were enjoying what you were doing. Cause like, no one's going to hire you if you're not good at what you do. So my question to you though, is about your voice. Like, did you go in, did you just say, I want to do this? I'm going to get on stage. I'm just going to sing the way you did when you were a kid, or were you trying to develop like a sound and a style at this point? I was trying to develop it. Went to San Francisco, had an audition for Rude Girl. I went in there and sang Annie Wilson. Oh, I love her. Annie Wilson's version of Rock and Roll by Zeppelin. Again, my drummer looked at me and said, do you know who Bon Scott is? Tried to sing like that. And again, I couldn't. But then I get introduced to Ronnie, Sabbath, Dickinson. I was like, mother. I, I want to be them. So again, I couldn't do it, but we were in the studio probably for a year and I would blow out. I'd be like, I have to stop rehearsing. No, I worked at it. I was, pr I probably worked at it for like a year. Mm -hmm. And then one day we started doing shows and I was like, ah, I think I got it. And then again, that was back in the day early and these people started taping you. I remember, oh, I would have a couple glasses of wine. I think I sounded so good. And then people started showing me that's when I became, my musical days are so sober because you think you sound so good. So that's when I really started working at it because I wanted to be the guys. I wanted to be them. So it was yeah. really important to me. I actually heard you say that in an interview that you really, when you were on the road, that you weren't like drinking and all of that, no. that you were really about protecting like your body. I can't. To perform. I yeah. don't know how people do that. I can't. I don't want to say it's hard but it's challenging and I have to keep my body in check big time. And again, in the eighties, you know, all these great productions on record and you would go to these shows and the vocalists never cut it. I was like, I used to say to Chastain, I'm not going to be that person. I'm mm -hmm. going to go in there and blow all the time. So yeah, it was really important to me. Yeah. Still yeah. Is, yeah. And also heard you say that you really, you really want to make sure that when people come see you play that they're hearing what they expect to hear. Exactly. Cause yeah. I want to hear that record. When I went to see Dio, you, the, uh, the, all the pros, the Tates, the Dickinsons, the Zeppelin, and they just pulled it off and I wanted to be one of those people. Yeah. So let's just take a step back. You had mentioned that you went from New York to San Francisco. When did you make, when did you um, make that decision? Because it sounds like you discovered the metal when you finally got out there, but you were already playing music on the East Coast. I wasn't doing anything. You talk about being sober, what I was, however old I was, and I was just, partying and I was so frustrated, didn't know what to do. Um, and I had, um, I was a horse trainer at a dude ranch and I stayed in touch with this woman. She called me up one day and she was in Berkeley. She goes, why don't you come out and see me? You could get out there for $99. So I went out and uh, that was it. I went out with like $220. And back then, I don't know how old you are, but back then they used to, we used to put posters on telephone poles looking for a drug yeah. or looking in some, and I knew that I wanted to sing, but I didn't know what to do. So somebody came up to me one day and said, look, I found this. And that was to audition for Rude Girl. And I was like, okay. And that's when I went. Okay. And it was at Hate hey, hey, Ashbury. I was like, oh, Hendrix Joplin. And that's when it all went. Yeah. When I moved, that was 82 or three, I think. Okay. So you were like, yeah. I'm going to pursue. So did you drop out of college and the whole bit? <laughs> <laughs> You were like done, moving I, on. I dropped out of college every year. I mean, that's I just like, okay. <laughs> you just knew that this was your thing. Yeah, it was not do it. Okay. Yeah. And was your family supportive, or were were they like, what is she well, doing? Like, I love my family so much. They always thought I was crazy, but no, they always supported me. You're making me think, Sarah. So I went home after being in New York, and I had shaved my head, and I got my first tattoo, and my hair was blue. And my mother, Connie, I love her so much. She said to me, my real name is Catherine. So she says to me, Kathy, in that upstate, Kathy, she goes, I don't know why you go so out of your way. You're so beautiful and you go so out of your way to make yourself look ugly. But I love <laughs> you and I support you 100%. That's all I had to hear. Oh, yeah, I'll be supporting you. Yeah. 
That's amazing. That's yeah, amazing. Yeah. All right. So, uh, so yeah, back in the day, uh, and I'm old enough to remember just um, maybe not necessarily around here, but the stories of everything being plastered, everything yeah. being postered. And definitely I remember things being tacked on, um, uh, <laughs> on what is it, telephone poles. Um, yeah, so yeah. you saw that and you saw your fate. And then you decided, so did you go out to the West Coast to like LA and then go to San Francisco? No, I went right to San Francisco. Or you just went straight to San Francisco. Yeah, okay. I've never been the, done the LA thing. Yeah. Okay, so you went straight to San Francisco. Yeah. So describe the scene to me when you first got there. Like, oh, what was happening? Insane. You could, we we would rehearse. It was before everybody got signed or just as it got signed. We rehearsed, ac- not across the street from Metallica, but we were obviously at the same pizza shop. Um, and it, it really, seriously, it was one big family. It didn't matter if you were a girl, a dog, a cat. Or, it, everyone was so supportive. Like, Kurt Hammett used to come to our shows. He would give me pointers. It was just Metal, 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 metal. Broadway, there was the Mabuhe, the stone. It was insane. It was just just tinkling and sparkly of metal. It was insane. So much fun. You could go, you could play anywhere, any night. You actually got paid. It was great. It was great. What was it exactly? Because I know my answer, and I think everybody in the metal community has their answer. What was it exactly about metal? Because you were already a music fan. Like you were, you know, music was your thing. (laughs) What was it about metal specifically? that pulled at you? Well, I went to school for musical theater and I can remember being on stage and they tell you all these things. And I can remember it was never enough for me. And again, it was when I get introduced to the Dio Sabbath records and to Rainbow, it was, it was just so powerful to me. And still it just sucks me in. It's like a freaking vacuum cleaner. It just, it's the only time I feel normal. Mm-hmm. And again, I couldn't sing it back then, but even when I tried, it's the only time I just felt like the aura. Yeah, just the, the aggressive. I wanted to be, I wanted to be powerful. I don't know if it's aggressive, mm-hmm. but I wanted people to look at me and it's almost like I wanted to spew this stuff into them. And I, I just wanted to share it so badly. I wanted to say something to them and share it. Yeah, it just got me. Dio's voice just got me. What was the aesthetic back then in San Francisco? Because I imagine it was different, um, especially the bands that you're mentioning from LA, because I'm like a huge 80s glam. Like I love all of that. You hit it on the head, Poison Metallica, but I get to tell you, I love them both. Give me a boy that wears makeup mm, any day. So it was very (laughs) different that way. Um, But I, again, I enjoyed both of them. I always had friends at whatever, Poison, all of them, but that was it. San Francisco was like, ah. Yeah. in LA was like, hey. Yes. Yeah, totally. So what were you, what was your style like? Cause I'm a big, I'm a big style person. I love your style. I've seen your pictures through the years. You always had great metal style and it seems very like organic to who you are. Were you yeah. doing anything like super fun back then or was it really low key and, uh, and again, that? I'm a low key person. I just want to do this. I don't, you don't have to look at me. You have to listen to me. Oh my God. The span is still the spandex, the high tops. That was before I was vegan. Sorry. So I wore a lot of leather. <laughs> the hair, yeah. Uh, I, I didn't, I didn't want to be, and I'm not anyway, I'm actually very butch, but I never wanted to be looked at as a woman because, oh my God, Dora's so beautiful. She's still beautiful. I love her. And Lita and then Lorraine came out. I didn't want to be that. I didn't want, I, I just wanted to be a dude. I used to say to people, why can't I freaking be Hetfield? Why can't I be him and his, his dirty hair and his jacket and his sneakers? So I was just a, a tomboy. Yeah. I didn't, it's not like I thought about it, but I wore black like everybody else. Yeah. Yeah. I still think you have a lot of style though. It's funny because you want to be a tomboy. You know, you make me think so. When I, first like, moved, cool when I first moved to San Francisco, it's when I really got thrown into the gay culture which I love and I had to go to Polk Street and buy my first steel toe high tops I mean uh, boots the leather boots that came up to your knees and they were steel toe because all my gay friends wore them so that was very important <laughs> so you I had forgot what they call them I forgot what they call them but I actually just found them from 20 years ago they're all purple now oh that's so funny all right so you so you moved out there you have um you joined uh I guess, was this your first band Rude first girl band? yeah yeah yes yeah. yeah. So tell me it's about the first, uh, Rude Girl. It's the first time I started getting press and stuff. And again, it was different back then for all these young bands. Labels would come out to see you. You'd be playing a show, there was CBS. I'd be at a pizza joint, there was Mike Varney from Shrapnel. It was such a big family that they went to you looking for talent. Mm-hmm. So um, Rude Girl got a lot of, a lot of hype. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And um, did you, were you getting... Um offers for record deals and things like that? Yeah, we were. 
Um, and of course we thought we knew everything, but I got a lot of offers. That's how I, yes, yes. We ended up getting an offer from CBS, which praise Jesus, I was smart enough to realize. But, but I was smart enough to know that that was back in the leather, no offense, uh, back in the Leather Angel days and Samantha Fox and it started getting really sexual with women didn't want to go there, but that was the 80s. And I think that was a downfall for me. CBS offered us this amazing deal. But then I started listening to them talking and they were talking about putting us in like uniforms. And there were many reasons why that didn't work out. But yeah, I did get a lot of attention from labels and I still know a lot of those people. So that broke me into the industry door, yes. So did it sound like if they, if they took you on, you were, they were going to do like a change of image and start airbrushing your clothes off and that sort of thing? And you also know as a vocalist, especially back then, when you, I used to rehearse for Sandy Perlman from Sabbath, mm -hmm. when a producer of that level listens to you do demo and doesn't say anything to you about your vocals, right. well, you know, this, something was up. Okay. If you don't get their critique from the beginning from these high power people, something's not right. Yeah. So did you pass on that deal or was it short lived? <laughs> Sarah, funny story. I have this thing. That's why I connected to you five minutes early. I'm an East Coast person, not a West Coast person. I have that trouble with my, my band right now. If you tell me two o'clock, it's two o'clock, not fucking two or three. Right. Two or five. <laughs> so we actually had the, this big lawyer. I'm sorry, I can't remember his name, but he was Country Joe and the Fish's lawyer and Airplane's big guy. We had a meeting at a certain time. There I am to sign the CBS deal with my pen. Half hour goes by. Oh, no band. Anyway, then they called me. The, I, long story short, I walked out. I said, fuck you. I walked out and I went to my house and I called my granny from Shop No Records and said, I need something to do. So that's really why it didn't happen. Cause I was ready. God, I wanted to tour. I wanted to be big, you know, but yeah. that's really why it didn't happen. That's amazing. Yeah. I love that. As an East coast girl, I can appreciate that. Cause <laughs> I can't do that. I can't freaking do that. Time is I would have uh, done it too. 202. I'm gone, man. I, yeah. I just, it's in my head. I can't do it. <laughs> All right. So eventually, um, uh, Root Girl, I believe, turned into, did it morph into Malibu Barbie? You know, everybody thinks that. It was, okay. a, um, I think it was just Sandy. It was a couple members that went into Malibu Barbie. Okay. Um, yeah, it's not like, and then I know it's interesting. And then they called the EP Rude Girls. Everybody was so dirty. So it gets a little Nothing different. to do with me. So did, so did one just end and a, and a new project yeah. began? Okay. Yeah. So then Malibu Barbie came to be? Yeah, Malibu, and the only reason I did that EP, which I can't believe got so much attention, is because I think the name of their singer was Stephen. He couldn't do the demo for some reason. They okay. called me up and said, can you just come in and do this really quick? I think it was in between like my first chest Angel. tour. And I mean, I didn't know the song. I had like them in one ear singing me the melody and then I, yeah. Okay. I just went in there for an hour and then said it's bye. So and it's forever I mean, it's part so of your raw. history now. <laughs> so raw. Yeah. That's but so sometimes funny. raw is the best. I right. still love it. I love my demo so much better than the crap in the studio. Yeah, yeah. That's so funny. So you mentioned you mentioned shrapnel, and I believe this ends up being a very important part of your history because of Chastain. What was that conversation um, with Mike Varney like? Mike Varney was amazing. I still love him and his wife, Kathy. He just started showing up. Oh, because I was, um, I became friends with Le Mans, Peter Marino, which was one of shrapnel's bands. We just started talking all the time. I mean, I can remember talking to Mike on the phone all the time. And also he wanted Rude Girl on Shrapnel. But then when CBS came a call and then Howie Klein, who did Madonna and everybody, I was like, bye-bye. We just became friends. And I, like I said, I remember going home and calling him. I don't remember, I don't remember exactly because Chastain, Chastain and I had this conversation a while ago. I'm like, Do you remember how we met or when we talked? I mean, we don't remember. But he said to me, I have something for you maybe. And then again, back in those days, somebody sent you a little four track cassette and uh, he gave it to me for like a week. And then we went into someone's bedroom and recorded it. So, and again, I don't know why Chastain was particularly looking for a female front. I think he just, the ranges that he was doing. And again, I don't know why a guitar god of the 80s said, oh, I want to check. But it just, <laughs> I, I recorded Mystery of Mystery of Illusion, Black Knight, and Winds of Change. And I was just, I was just fearless back then. Um, and it just, Justin loved it. And that was it. And again, I don't remember how my first conversation with Justin, I'm like, I, we must have talked before I went out there. He goes, yeah, I guess. <laughs> I 
another thing that I've read and this, I would love clarification on this. Another thing that I read is it sounded like you were all pulled together. Like Mike Varney was like, oh, these people would be great. Let me introduce them. Like Fred Corey, you yes. and so on. Is that really how it came together? Was it like, yes. these people are really talented. Let me, let me pair them yes. and have them record. And I just remember, yes, I went up to Katati, Prairie Sun, which is right up the street from me still just walking in and meeting everybody and going, oh, and I was so green, although I always had an attitude. Yeah, that was it. We were like, hey, 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 yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's very okay. basic, nothing fan. Yeah, yeah. I was just like, holy shit, I'm in a studio. Let me show you what I can do. <laughs> although again, I was really green. I didn't know what I was doing, but I was so balls to the wall, man. I was so into it. That's awesome. I'm so like, I'm guessing I'm a check, check this out. You think I'm gonna check this out? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So I'm guessing for that first album that it was, was it already written? Like those, you mentioned yes. those songs, but the whole album. Like was, most Chastain things, it was already written. He it was already written and he was looking for great musicians to come record. Yes. And then tour. Yes. I don't think we toured off Mr. Evolution though, right? Yeah. But I, I don't think it was ever really his thing because he's, he still went tour. Chastain, it was just a recording project. Okay. He just, another outlet to get his music out. And then it just kind of blew up, but that was not his goal, I don't think. Okay, so the goal was never really to become like a band that toured, record, tour. It was just a project, just a project. Amazing, okay. But do you feel from your perspective, it must have felt like more than just a project? Oh, dude, I was was like your life, right? I wasn't gonna let Chastain go. Are you kidding me? Hello, where's next right now? Yeah, yeah. I was so, you know, I think about that now in my older life. I always trusted other people and just let them go, let them do it. I should have been more in control, but... I always assumed it would be more because it was so easy for us. Mm-hmm. It's still so easy with Chastain. Yeah, it was so easy. And like I said, we got so much hype out of it. I'm like, how can we not do something else, you know? So I just went home and waited for the plane tickets to come for me. <laughs> <laughs> and just go on tour. And these were like the glory days of like touring and you probably had like a yeah. nice. I didn't know that you did anything else. I didn't, I thought that's just, but like I said, we didn't tour for Mr. Evolution and I don't know why. I think we just went into Rule of the Wasteland really fast. Okay. You just moved into the next album. So is that, is, would that be why you, um, so you're in this great band that makes these great albums, but you did do here and there, you would do these solo albums. And I was going to ask you why the solo albums, if you're in this great band, but it's- Oh, oh, of- oh, no, that, oh God, that was so much later. Oh, no, 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 no. Um, the only- <laughs> The only reason that Shockwaves came to be, and I tell everybody now, I'm sure Monty Connor's gonna kill me, but look, nobody was interested in me okay. at all. It was just like Chastain, oh, the, the Chastain band. So Road Racer at the time, who's now Road Runner, mm-hmm. wanted to do For Those Who Dare. That was way, way down the line. In the only way, I know Chastain made a deal because I was sitting around going, wow, why am I not as big as everybody else? Why not? I'm good. So uh, that was part of the deal. So they let me do a solo record, which they did nothing with. Okay. It was just all part of the package. Yeah. Okay. It was like, let her do her thing, but then don't do anything right. with it. Okay. That's why I'm so happy that it's so big. Yeah. They didn't care about me. Okay. <laughs> but it must've been satisfying for you to be able to do it. And that's oh, yes. that very different for you than it was doing a Chastain album. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't, the material that. wasn't that different because that's who I am, but I think it was just, I got to write it. I got to write the melodies and the lyrics, most of it. So yeah. Yeah. It was really, I, I still love that record. I can, I can't listen to most of my records. I do. I can still listen to that one. Yeah. How, um, what's your writing process? I mean, and, and perhaps it's different then than it is now, but what was your writing process back then when you did that first solo album? Uh, I picked out the music Mm -hmm. and uh, again, it was back in the day of the cassette tapes. And I I always used to stay because I would always go to Ohio and we would play like Thursday through Sunday. And then the rest of the days we would just be there. And I always stayed with Ron, Ron Coy, my lighting man. And I just put that cassette in and I just sat there doing melodies and writing it down. And then I went into the studio. Was it? Nice. And is that the process now or now do you work a little differently? Well, the process now is really different with myself and Vinny Tex uh god he drives me crazy guitar players drive me crazy but <laughs> but now we go back and forth he sends me musical ideas and then we work on the music and then we go back and forth with my melodies yeah it's very different now yeah okay. back in the day it was Chastain stuff here you go learn it okay yeah okay sounds good um yeah. I imagine I imagine you prefer working with someone um whether well, I do be crazy back or not. Then, <laughs> back then, I didn't realize that I could write. And again, the Chastain sound is Chastain. Mm-hmm. You know, he would throw me a bone once in a while for my songs, but 
And I was okay with that. Adjusting sound is adjusting sound. So when I actually hooked up with Vinny, I was kind of, I was just having this conversation with him. I'm like, shit, I hope I can do this. This is a lot of responsibility for me, but yeah, I can do it. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So you, at some point, decided to take, I don't know if you decided to take or if it just happened, a break, a hiatus, I I guess you call it. Yeah. Uh, And you're just so passionate about music and so metal. I wonder what was it that like inspired that you to take a break from music for so long? I don't, I, I, now that I think about it in my older year, I don't know, but, but I can tell you that we had reached a point after for those who dare wasn't growing, wasn't going anywhere. And David Chastain, who I adore, I talk to him all the time. I think we had a different idea of what we wanted to do. Like I said, he never wanted to tour. I'm like, let's pack up. I know that we had some big offers at his band that he turned down. I wanted to do something different. I wanted to be massive. Right. And, and then again, I think we were just burnt out. Record, 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 tour, 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 tour. Um, and it was nothing that was even said. Um, no big fight, no big anything. And my thing was, look, for those who dare, I got a lot of blah, blah, blah. I'm going to go home and take six months off and then I'm going to come back. Well, <laughs> in that six months, I can remember really starting to get into more extreme music. And I tried to audition for more because everybody laughed at me. Um, it was so funny. I can remember this one band that I will not mention that I wanted to, and they were like, you're only a girl. And I was like, fuck you. Listen to Seventh of Never. But anyway, and I would meet with all these labels. And again, the attitude of the labels where they didn't want me to be leather. They were all like pop or sex. And I, I didn't want to settle. It's not like, oh, make me a star. I wanted to do metal and right. nobody was interested in it. And also I got to tell you, I'm kind of lazy. I'm like, oh, okay. And my thing was, look, I've done really well. I, I'm proud of myself. Okay. A lot of therapy, I got to tell you. And that's, my, <laughs> that's also my personality. When I'm done, I'm done. done. I go, okay. I go. Uh, I stopped going to, sh- I stopped doing everything. Yeah. So you just, I got so it. Was, it, like, was yeah. it like, I, I know how I want to do it. If I can't yeah. do it the way I want to do it, I don't need to do it at all. And you're just willing to. And I didn't, I didn't really have anybody behind me to help me, to push me. And like I said, I'm lazy. I need somebody to, so it was okay. It was good. I'm like, Hey, I had a great run, dude. Yeah. You can't take anything away from me. So yeah. Did yeah. you, did you know, once you got past that six months, did you realize it would be like, was it 20 years? Did it end up being 25 <laughs> really did you realize it would be that like were you really were you really like I'm done or did you feel I, like um, I, I, I was done years okay so you really felt like it was like I said I, I got into animals I got into the whole pit bull thing yeah. yeah yeah so did you go back to school for that or did you just start oh, no no <laughs> <laughs> I don't do school I just got involved with an animal hospital and people and I just threw myself into that yeah okay so like you found another passion and yeah you did the that. Two. I have two passions. I'm lucky. Animals and metal. I'm very lucky. Yeah. Yeah. So I just wonder though, as a fan of metal, in order to just step away, do you, yeah. do you just cut yourself off completely or yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. 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 Justin used to say to me all the time, Oh my God, you're so good. You need to be doing something. Yeah. I don't want to it. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. what happened? Yeah, I cut myself. Well, that was pre-social media really. So yeah. Okay, but fans have got to find you here and there at the grocery store or wherever. So what happens in that moment in those years when somebody finds you and says, "Oh, I know, God, I was so to, excited." I went to a couple of Doro shows and people would be like, "Um, I don't know. I, you know, I mean, people don't realize what it, I mean. The music industry is brutal. So, I mean, I enjoyed the moment, but yeah, I mean, I obvi- I've always been so grateful and gracious to people. Oh my God, you, you pay attention to my music. Thank you. Are there, yeah okay thank you very much have a good night you know yeah yeah mm-hmm. yeah so then something happened clearly where you decided to that you needed it back in your life that you wanted to do it again so what was that moment well what were those um, moments that came unfortunately from? it was when we lost ronnie um mm-hmm. i didn't even i was so out of the metal scene that i didn't even realize he was sick and i got a call one day from someone that he was ill and then five days later he was gone um that, that it's so crazy it had such an effect on me and I um I went down to LA for the services and stuff um hanging out with people and looking around and I can remember it was at the uh, cemetery which is so beautiful where he is but I just went walking around and I was like what the fuck are you doing hmm. 
I always call it a gift from the gods. And he, anyway, and I started feeling really like disgusted with myself that I had this talent and I was doing nothing. So it was a death of him. Um, and then I hooked up with some people because I hadn't sang in a long time. I started going into studios and stuff. I destroyed those tapes, let me tell you. Um, I, I'm sorry, I can't think of the name of the people right now, but it was a band that Sandy Sledge from Mood Girl was involved in and they were very kind to me and they would go in and let me do some vocals over their tracks just to, so that was it. And I felt like I owed it to him. Um, yeah, I, I did it for that reason. How could you, you know, I mean, I'm good. This, that's what God gave me, I should be doing this. So that was a turnaround for me. You know, um, you I know that you're such a great fan of his. Did you ever get to work with him or tour with him when he was alive? No, no. no. I was I, I would hang out with him quite a bit though, and I was always like, oh, we have to, we have to. No, I did not. I no. didn't have the privilege. Yeah, but a great inspiration. Oh my God, I would just stare at him. And something in this life off shockwaves is written about a conversation I had with him. One of the first times I met him, I. <laughs> and I said, you know, I don't mean to be like such a fangirl, but you need to know for a young vocalist like me, do you know the power and the magic and the, whatever the term is, what you fill us up with? Hmm. And he said to me, um, he goes, it's something that you were, it's something in this life that you will acquire. He goes, it's age and it's working and it's just keep doing it. He goes, you're good enough. Just keep peace of mind. He goes, it's, you'll find it. And that's where that whole song came oh, from. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. That's and of course, I bawled and walked out. I mean, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was always really good to me. And he listened to tapes of me. He was always just really honest with me. I mean, it's not like we were good buddies. I would see him when he toured here. He'd let me in. I mean, I just love the guy. Yeah. Like everybody. Yeah. Like everyone. I know. Who doesn't? Um, so so after that, you went into the studio with some musicians. You did some work. You didn't feel compelled to save it, but you, you had that opportunity to put it out there and get it out there and then what was after that did you start writing again did you start working with musicians like what how did you yeah. get up to that next step that was the sledge leather thing I started writing with Sandy again the drummer from a uh, rude girl and we were blessed enough we hooked up with um Jimmy Bain before we lost him and Scott the keyboard player from Dio so I was involved in that whole thing and oh my god we played a couple shows house of blues blah 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 nothing ever really happened but I went, I think it was called Sound City. And oh my God, there I was on the stage where Ronnie used to practice. So yeah, I got back into it. Did the Sledge Leather record, um, Imagine Me Alive. Just put that out there. And then through all the stuff, Chastain is always here watching me. And through that record, which again, we just put it out ourselves. It was no big dent in the world. That's how then Chastain got in touch with me and said, hey, I have some material that I think could be a Chastain record. And I said, well, we have to be good enough. We, we have to bounce mm -hmm. back. Mm -hmm. So hence surrender to no one in 13. And then we continued on to we bleed metal, but it wouldn't tour. So. Okay. So it kind of back in that same spot you were in before of you do the great album. His house but... in Georgia. He looked at me and he goes, leather, he calls him in this leather. Okay. I want you to know. He said, I'm not touring. Okay. Because I want you to know that. Cause he goes, I know that's all you want to do. I'm like, okay. I figured I could change his name. He goes, I'm not, I'm done. Yeah. Okay, so are but you, are you still never, a member me, of Chastain? It never Leather? hurts me. It never hurts me to do a Chastain record. So I was like, okay, right. <laughs> so are you a member of Chastain? Like you'll continue to at the moment continue to oh, Chastain, okay. and then you're doing your own albums, and we'll tour those. I'm sure that we'll do another Chastain record in 20 years. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> this is how the whole Brazilian thing happened. Um, someone got in touch with Chastain after We Bleed Metal and they wanted him to tour Brazil. He will not do it. So he gets in touch with me and said, hey, blah, 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 called me, don't know anything about them. Are you interested? Are you kidding me? That's how everything opened up for me now. Yeah. Okay. And then you did that tour and then. Yeah. Uh, that was 2014. I went down, you know, for a weekend, just did some Chastain stuff. Amazing. Those, oh my God, I'm, I have to get down to Brazil. I was talking to my guitar player today. I'm probably going to go down there really soon. I love it. Amazing. And then um, 2000, was it 16? Uh, this promoter called me up and said, hey, I want to throw you on the Rob Rock tour. You know, the Chris Pelletieri Center, Rob Rock. Opened for him. Oh my God, and there was my band. Ah! Yeah, there they were. Yeah. So um, what does it feel like to be on stage after all those years of not doing it? Did it feel like you hadn't ever left? 
or was it like this bizarre tingly feeling that you know of something like like what was that was it does was it different it or was, was it like yeah it was like I had never left but now I'm old enough to appreciate it I was like I mean I ball probably all the time people in Brazil would start singing the they have this soccer song that they sing they would say no a lot of times and I'm no no so I would turn around and go like this um, <laughs> it's the only time because I'm actually kind of awkward it's the only time that I feel powerful is too narcissistic but it's the only time I feel at home and I want to share this with you with you yeah, no, it was incredible. I'm kind of shy though on stage. I look at myself, it takes me a long time to get to get into it, but no, it's it's home. I was like, mother of God, yeah, yeah, where have you been? I knew you'd be here. You know? And especially in Brazil or just South America in general, to have a 21-year-old person sing a song that was written, sing a song back to you that was written before they were born. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's mind-boggling. I'm like, what the fuck? I'm like oh my dad how do you even know that song or whatever. <laughs> yeah and they the, the women down there have the streak and the, oh my god incredible incredible amazing. that's amazing so um you know there have been a couple of years since then and now but you I know you're working on another album which I'm so excited about so let's talk yeah. about that album what is that new album called it's called we are the chosen um, Vinny Tex and I wrote the whole thing. Oh my God, I can't believe it. And, it kept, and again, like many bands say, because of COVID, what the hell did we have to do? So we wrote for two years. I had a tour that got canceled because of COVID. Um, it's, it's, really, I, it's really different for me in the aspect of that Vinny is really, really eclectic in the music that he listens to and the music that he has played. So he brought in all these elements that I really didn't understand because oh, I'm like so 80s metal. Mm -hmm. So he really forced me to write differently. Um, it's so great. I mean, seriously, I get teary eyed when I hear it. Um, and again, we did it from start to finish. It's it, called We Are the Chosen. It is now finished. Now I'm working on the details of what I'm going to do next, but it's really um, Marcelo Vasco who did all the Slayer, Testament, all the death metal album covers. Mm -hmm. um, oh, nice. I mean, it's safe, so. Nice. So dealing with the Brazilian mafia, as I call them, they're all extreme. They, their life is just extreme metal, black metal, death metal. So them working on my stuff, perfect. Working on a lyric video right now. I know, I'm just working on a lot of stuff. And I guess maybe that's where the gods finally posted me because I know that I don't do extreme metal, but my heart is in, oh my God, that new Arch Enemy record. Oh my God. So I have those type of people behind me now. So it's really exciting. Amazing. So musically, is it is it still kind of what we're familiar with as people who love your music or is it leaning? Is it leaning and reaching? No, no, no. It's different. the same. I, I just think it's way more melodic. Okay. It's way more catchy. Like I said, there's all different parts in it that sometimes I listen to and go, where the fuck did that come from? It's still metal. It's still leather. It's still metal. It's still it's you. Just, I think the songs are really constructed really intelligently. They were really thought out. Um, he blew, he blew playing guitar on this record. He is not a metal head. He doesn't do that. The guy loves melody. So it's okay. really, it's so great. It's how, real. I'm really proud of it. How did My you best meet? How did you meet? Again, when I did the Rob Rock tour, I was working with one guitar player, Rob Rock had two. So we were at some club and Rob Rock was a really good tour for me because you know he would sell out thousand theaters. And I was just watching this guy. I was already using a, a Chiago, the bass player, a Braulio, the drummer. And I was looking at this guitar player going, and I looked at my promoter at the time. I said, you know, this is my band. And we wrote Leather 2. Um, Leather 2 was a really fast, congested, unthought out record. Glad I did it, brought me back out there. And then a lot changed with COVID and I just stayed in touch with this guitar player, Vinny. I said, let's try to write, and he's amazing. We just, he gets me, he knows me, he knows that I'm lazy, so he pushes me, oh my God. <laughs> um, so it just really worked. We really write well together because he knows my voice, he respects me. It's, it's really cool. It's a, a relationship I've never had. That's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. So the, the music's done. We're working on like album cover art and all the really cool, fun stuff. Lyrics. Basically it's done. I'm just now waiting to see what the next is. 
Okay. Yeah, I wish I, I always want to post the cover, but I can't. Yeah. 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 And so do we have, um, have we picked a date yet or we're still? No, I have no idea. Feeling I'm, I'm, that out. It'll be out this year, okay. but I, I don't know really what's going to happen because I have to do it right. And again, it's all my decision. So I have to be very careful. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah. And then tour, tour dates, because we know we like to tour. Yeah, I like to tour. I'm still working on all that too. Tour, 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 tour. Um, <laughs> so like I said, it's all, it's all baby steps, you know. Um, I know I still have my suitcase uh, from when I went to, I went to Portugal to do pre-production with Vinny and then we went to Poland. My bag, literally, I still have some of his shoes in here. Um, but you know, it's really hard to tour and really expensive to tour. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's really frustrating for me because my touring band is in Brazil and not here, but we'll see. I'm really excited. And, and I get a lot of uh, DMs and stuff from young people in bands saying, what should I do? What should I do? And I guess, I don't really know what to do, but I want everyone to know that things come later. Mm -hmm. You know, you're in your thirties going, oh my God, well, I made the mistake in doing it. And then look, your life can change at any time. You know, you never know what's going to happen. Just be, have an open, be open, open, open. It might not happen when you're 25. Yeah. yeah. And it's okay. It's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think in your life, it, it looks like it's, it's happened at least twice, right? Or you could say three times because you had your career with, uh, with the animals and then you have yeah. a career in your early life and you have your career now. So yeah, yeah pretty lucky. I yeah. would like to be in a major tour, then I'd be really lucky. But um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, and also I'm just more grateful now, you know, when you get older, you think about what you have and what you don't have. But yes, I want to tour like a motherfucker. Oh my God, that's all I can think about. But it has to be the right thing. I have to be wise, you know? Yeah, yeah. Are there any bands um, that you would love to tour with? I mean, you, you mentioned a bunch of some of the newer bands that it sounds like you're really excited about. I, would that be a good match or? Oh God, no. I, it's funny. People ask me all the time. And again, I don't like to say women and men, but these freaking females. Yeah. Uh, is her name Elisa from Arch Enemy? Elisa, is that how you say it? Or Elisa. Elisa. And Tatiana from Ginger. Courtney from Spirit Box, these women are blowing my mind. Um, you know, but it's interesting. I've always wanted to tour with Godsmack. I just think that would be a great tour. I don't know why. <laughs> Godsmack, Megadeth. I mean, I would do whatever it takes. Um, the guy, again, that did my cover is the Troops of Doom down in Brazil, guitar player. And I'm like, hey, I could find some really aggressive songs to open. I'm wide open. And I think I'm blessed enough to have enough respect and cult. You know, I can, I'll pull anything off. And again, you're making me think back in the days when I used to, um, Rude Girl, we used to open for Exodus and Megadeth. Mm -hmm. Megadeth. Sarah, we would get beers thrown at us and spit. Oh. And it was a great training ground. You, you couldn't get me <laughs> off stage, motherfucker, but it was. <laughs> it was I can remember I opened for my Megadeth when they first came out down at a, a place in Palo Alto, the Stone. It was killer. That was back in his partying days. And we got, that's actually Wasp was there. That's when I got to know Blackie. We got hammered, mm -hmm. shoes, beers. And I'm like, hey. And I remember Dave said to me, good job. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't really have any fear that way. If I know you don't like me, I'll be singing right in your face. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's your because calling. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but I just, I just like it. I, I really enjoy it. I mean, metal's just awesome. Thank God we have metal, right? Thank God. Thank God. Yeah. You know, you yeah. know, my favorite thing about metal, and I use that term regardless of what kind of music it is, whether it's like the heavy stuff or stuff that's really yeah, me too. technically me hard too. rock. I mean, I know a Large lot of family. the metal that I listen to is really more heavy rock more than it is metal, uh, but I still, I love, the thing I love about it is it's like this big thing and it's evolved and there's so many different subgenres. but I think the one thing that is most appealing is it's, I think it pulls us all for the same reason. It's yes. just something That's a good about it. There's an ident there's something that you can identify with and you don't have to change who you are to belong to it. I think that's what it really is about metal. That that's a really everybody. good observation. It, it all draws us in. And it's such a huge family. You're right. Everyone gets into these uh, titles, but yeah, it's very true. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great thing to be a part of. So I, I always love to ask this question and I know it's a very difficult one to answer, but I'm going to ask you anyway, because um, you're somebody that people greatly admire and you've had this amazing career. Um, people do always want advice from people who've done the thing, who've had this career, who've recorded albums, who've been on tour. And even though the landscape has changed, um, you have 
uh, managed to have this career and you are in the same landscape that a lot of these younger bands are in. Do you have any advice for uh, a young musician or even a musician who isn't so young who wants to do what it is that you've been doing? Keep your clothes on, mm -hmm. um, demand respect. You have to demand respect through your talent. And I think, God, I was just having this conversation with a new band I met, Telgander from UK. You have to really do it because you love it. It has to be in your soul. You can't do it to be famous, to fuck girls, to get high. I've had many people that think they want to do it. And then they come into the studio with me and see what it's really like. And they're like, no. You have to not be afraid to suck because as a vocalist, oh, we're always going to suck. We're going to make mistakes. I, 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 you just, I think you have to love it. It has to be inside of you. And the more you do, oh my God, you have to work your ass off. The glory that they see that hour on stage has got nothing to do with the reality of it. I think you just really have to love it. You have to find out if you love it. Go out and do it. Go suck at a bar. Go have stuff thrown at you. Have people tell you that you suck. Yeah. yeah. You just have to, you have to find out if you generally love it, I guess, would be the thing. That's amazing. Keep your clothes on, girls. <laughs> Keep your clothes on. I love it. I love it. Well, thank you so much for joining me. And you have to come back again. Um, yes, when the album it. is um, when the album is out, and it's right know, here. We are the chosen. I love scene. it. We can see the album art, and then we know about the dates and all of that. Definitely come back. Um, but I'm so excited to meet you and to have you on. And you're amazing. And I love listening to all of your stuff and just just makes me Thank excited you. about metal every time I listen to it, any of the stuff. I know, I'm like a 12 year old. I, I'm so, ex I'm so excited. You're making me think when I met my band and they're all in their thirties, I was talking to my mom and she was, well, you finally found somebody that can keep up with you. And I'm like, yeah, so <laughs> it was nice meeting you too, Sarah. I love and respect you too, for sure. You're doing a great job. Thank you so much. Of course. I hope you enjoyed today's episode of Metal Net TV's Conversations. Make sure that you're subscribed to this channel and be sure to follow me on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. I will be back with another amazing episode of Conversations as well as my other show, Metal Bites. I'll see you soon. Take care and have a great week.